for once, let's be positive on this, gentlemen. I want to spend some time today to talk about the most underrated players in the league. Players that deserve more shine, deserve more recognition than what they get. Um, now, is this list, is this video actually going to be a video on the true most underrated players in the league? Probably not. I genuinely do believe the most underrated players in the league are players that wouldn't even be mentioned in a most underrated players video. Players that we truly do not talk about. Um, and the list is fluid. <laughs> Shout out to Steven. The list is fluid. The pendulum does swing in this overrated, underrated conversation. Um, but nevertheless, let's, let's start this video off, man. And this might already rattle some feathers. Because y'all might be asking, why, why is he in this video? And I want to start off the video with one Giannis Antetokounmpo. Okay. I think Giannis has been the, the victim of comparison is the thief of joy. I think Giannis is one of the victims of we are in this era of so much inflated numbers. Everyone is putting up crazy stats that we take certain numbers for granted. We take certain levels of production for granted. And while, yes, he is in the MVP discussion, I do believe a majority of players have Giannis in, in the top four um, MVP leaders. I don't think, just for the season as a whole, he's gotten the recognition that he deserves, primarily, primarily also because of the fact that the Milwaukee Bucks have been underachieving. But I do think this is one of those cases where two things can be true at once. The Minnesota Timberwolves, uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves, the Milwaukee Bucks can both be underachieving while one of their players are being overlooked like crazy because of the fact that the team expectations have just overshadowed everything. And I think for Giannis having a season where he's averaging 30 points, uh, this may be his best scoring season, actually. Let me look at his true shooting percentage. Um, yeah, this is his one of one of, if not arguably, his best um efficiency seasons. Let me see, let me see. True shooting relative to league shooting. 58. Okay, this this 2019 still might got it beat from an efficiency standpoint relative to the league. But from a pure efficiency standpoint, this is Giannis's most efficient scoring season while having the second highest volume of his career. Um, from a rebounding standpoint, he's still giving you 11 to 12 rebounds a game. From a playmaking standpoint, I think Giannis has genuinely made an improvement. Um, he's averaging six to seven assists a night now compared to five or six throughout a majority of his career. And defensively, he is still that. Um, in terms of the face of the league conversations as well, um, I've, I don't know if y'all heard of my, uh, of my take on it, but I do feel like there is a level of xenophobia involved in that. And I do feel like if we, if we just close our eyes and I tell you the career that Giannis has had from 2019 to 2024, and we change that name from Giannis to Cooper flag, from Giannis to hell, Zion, from Giannis to LeBron, these face of the league conversations, these marketing problems that people want to talk about with the NBA would not exist if Giannis was American, um, if Jokic was American, if Luka was American. It's not just a Giannis thing. But nevertheless, 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 I do, th I do feel like Giannis is, the pendulum is swinging a little bit to Giannis becoming one of the more underappreciated players in the league, in my opinion. Um, next up, the next player I want to bring up is Paolo Banchero. Paolo Banchero. Paolo Banchero in his second season in the league is averaging 22.5 points, 6-7 rebounds a game, 5 assists a game, on 46-34, 72 splits. The reason why he is on this list is because I feel like I've never seen a number one overall pick actually live up to the hype from a production standpoint and to a winning standpoint. Honestly, overachieving in the winning standpoint and not get talked about as much as Paolo. Both from from going into his draft all the way up until now. I also don't think he gets the media coverage that he deserves. Paolo is the number one overall pick from Duke University. Is American, I believe. Um, was productive as fuck at Duke. Was the number one overall pick. Got drafted to Orlando. And I'm maybe I'm tripping. But I don't even think Orlando is like a small market. When I think of Orlando, Florida. 
Uh, I I think that's a pretty big market in the league. I don't I don't know. I don't know, especially with the ties to Disney and all of that. Um, and from a production standpoint in the league, again, 20, 20 and a half points, five rebounds, uh, seven rebounds, five assists. And from a winning standpoint, this team is about to win 46 to 48 games this season. Um, right now they're the five seed, but literally two nights ago, they were the three seed. Like honestly, just in the grand scheme of things, not too far off from the two seed. Like Paolo has really been what you would want from a number one overall pick. He's showing you potential as well to become something even greater than what he's already showing. But for some reason, he doesn't get that shine. And it's very, very weird to me. It's very, very weird to me. I think uh, two of the most overlooked number one overall picks in recent memory are Cade and Paolo. For, and, and for players who have not been like bust, bust, not like Adam Morrison, Anthony Bennett levels of bust, it's just crazy how lack of um coverage that they're getting from just not not even just national media but just you know uh, us on twitter us on instagram and all of that that's crazy to me um but yeah i, I want to spend some time in this video to shout out one palo banchero next up another former number one overall pick i want to shout out zion williamson <laughs> i think zion williamson is a dude who has flown under the radar I think he is a guy that has not deserved, has not received the credit that he deserves. And primarily, it is because of off-court shenanigans. Primarily, is it is because he's had one healthy season in his career so far in five years. Well, now two, but leading up to the season, one out of four years being healthy. Um, he consistently remains out of shape. Um, and all the hype that he got going into his draft, which was Vic LeBron levels of hype, I know that's crazy to say, but that's how crazy it was. A lot of that has died down, and I feel like NBA fans have given up on Zion. There was this hope that this guy is a generational talent. He's one of the best super uh, uh, upcoming superstars in the league, and we have just given up on that. You know, there, there was a, a point in time where the future of the league was supposed to be JT, John Morant, Zion, and Luka, and now is. I feel like that hype within that four has died down. But this season, I feel like Zion, at least from, from me, he's making me buy back a lot of his stock. Making me buy back a lot of his stock. For one, he's having the healthiest season of his career, full stop. He's about to play 67 to 70 games a season. Um, from a production standpoint, was he the volume scorer that he was in 2021? Yeah, even last year, no. But I do believe the the style of play that he's playing at right now is more conducive to wins. Um, and they don't need him to score 27. When you got B.I. giving you um, 21 himself. When you got C.J. McCollum giving you 20. When you got uh, Trey Murphy improving himself and giving you 14. When Jonas giving you 12. He does not need to score 27. So has his volume gone down? Absolutely. Has his field goal percentage gone down? Abs uh not absolutely, but you know, I, I would say it has gone down as well. Um Is he even the rebounder that he was in his second season? Uh, uh we might have to look at per one hundred possession stats. Yeah, probably not, right? But um I do feel like specifically in the second half of this season, um he has shown a level of production that in my opinion deserves a lot of the stock being bought back. And I do think Zion has found a way to both get himself in shape and improve his skills as well. You know what I'm saying? When when people suffer through the the struggles that Zion has had in his career, they spend a lot of that rehab process is trying to get back to square one, trying to get back to where they were before all of this happened. Um, I've seen it with D. Rose. I've seen it with a guy like DeMarcus Cousins. You know what I'm saying? Instead of spending that time trying to improve your game, you spend that time just trying to get back to what you were, and then we'll focus on improving your game. But somehow Zion has effectively managed to do a majority of both, right? Um, we're looking at a guy over the last 16 games, and mind you, there are a lot of W's in this. Maybe not lately, but more specifically, like up up to here. So let, let's let's even up the sample size, right? Let's 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 go up to here. In the last 30 games of the season, is giving you 24 points, 6 rebounds, 5 assists, 
56% shooting from the field, and 74% shooting from the line while getting there eight times a game. 24, 5, and 6, bro. Like, that's... Those are really good numbers. And they're producing the wins, but no one is talking about it. Like, it's it's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, I think Zion has a chance to win back a lot of people in the playoffs, playing at a bigger stage um, with more attention on him. So hopefully he does prove a lot of motherfuckers wrong. But yeah, for the season that he's having, Zion is, in my opinion, is not getting talked about enough. So shout out to Zion. Now, I might be saying so far, B-Souls, are we just talking about underrated stars? Like, what are we doing? Let's go ahead and talk about some role players, y'all. The next player I want to talk about is Aaron Gordon. Shout out Aaron Gordon. I think the impact that Aaron Gordon has on the Denver Nuggets gets so overstated. It's actually insane. As far as a defensive anchor on this team, I would argue that is actually Aaron Gordon. That is actually Aaron Gordon. I'm I'm looking at their team, even just just thinking about how they play. Unless you really value KCP's uh, point of attack defense, you you can make that argument. But in terms of the anchor of that defense, a guy that you can put on bigger dudes in the league, um, Aaron Gordon is that dude. Great help side defender as well. Just athletic as shit, dog. Athletic as shit. Strong as shit, too. Um, also versatile enough to defend a couple of wings in the league. Um, Aaron Gordon is just so valuable to this team defensively. Um, and offensively as well. Being the lob threat that he is. Like, bro, I've seen Nicole Jokic and Aaron Gordon make plays that like literally do not make sense to me. And their chemistry is so on point. It's just beautiful to watch. It's just, it's just beautiful to watch. Having have him being a lob threat on the offensive end, being this efficient too. And, you know, I've I've even seen him try to create uh from the perimeter here and there. Um, he can give you three to four assists a night too. I just think Aaron Gordon. Aaron Gordon to me is like what every four in the league should be. In my opinion, like when you think if if Aaron Gordon just shot a little bit better from three, like if if this was like 36, 37 percent, Aaron Gordon to me would be the prototypical four in the league. Of just a guy who can grab boards, be physical defensively, be a lob threat, um, you know, cat uh, shoot from the perimeter. You know what I'm saying? Like Aaron Gordon is so underrated. And I would love to have an Aaron Gordon. Uh, on my team, and he's just a dog too, man, you know what I'm saying, so I want to give some credit to a guy like Aaron Gordon, next up, another role player, and we are going to go to Los Angeles, I want to talk about D'Angelo Russell, shout out to D'Lo, man, (laughs) shout out to D'Lo, I remember the conversations y'all were having with D'Lo, post playoffs, number one, and also during the trade deadline this season, and it didn't make sense to me back then, and it still doesn't make sense to me today. And I'm glad he proved me right and proved y'all wrong. I did not get why y'all wanted to get rid of D'Lo so fucking bad for a guy that... Let's let's look at his numbers leading up to the trade deadline. Let's just go to the All-Star break because the trade deadline was a little bit after the All-Star break. I don't know the exact date of the trade deadline. But leading up to the All-Star break was giving you 18 points and 6 assists on 47, 42, 81 splits. What do you want from a point guard alongside LeBron James? Honestly, you just want shooting, but he was giving you playmaking and shot creating ability as well on top of that? Like, what the fuck do y'all want from D'Lo? Like, holy shit. You know what I'm saying? Even from a moment standpoint, like, I've seen D'Lo make so many big shots for this team this season. Um... You know, I loved his attitude going into the season in terms of who who's the player I want to be. I want to be Derek White. I don't want to be a star. I don't want to be all this. I just want to I want to be a Los Angeles Laker for one. And I want to win basketball games. And I think, honestly, he's a really, really, really big part as to why this team is about to end the season with one a better record than last season. And number two, just being a better team than last season, bro. Like, I think in terms of that third star, that L.A. is searching for alongside A.D. and LeBron. I don't understand why the production from D'Lo and Austin Reeves is not enough to compensate for that third star. I would argue in this league, number one, depth is more important. LeBron has also said that, which is LeBron makes some fucking calls in that locker room. But for a team who not only has D'Lo, 
but also has on top of that Austin Reeves giving you 16, 6, and 4 on these splits. On top of that has Rui Hachimura giving you 14 on these splits. I truly feel like this team already has the makeup, already has the talent to make it all the way to the finals, if not win it. It's just there's a coaching issue. It's just they're in a tough conference. So that's a whole another side tangent, but um, I just want to shout out the D-Lo, man. I just, because after, after he got traded to Brooklyn, things were looking a little bit shaky for D-Lo. Is he on a decline? What is what is D-Lo's place in this league for real, for real? Um, and I think he's really found a home in L.A. that I really hope he can stay at, <laughs> for real, for real. So shout out to D'Angelo Russell. Moving back to the New Orleans Pelicans, I want to shout out, oh my God, CJ, I cannot type right now, CJ McCollum. <laughs> CJ McCollum. I think um, when you look at his career, CJ has been a 20-point-per-game scorer since 2016 when he won most improved. So he was recognized then. But ever since then, and, you know, if you look back at these years who actually made the All-Star team, it probably made sense, right? But a guy who's never made an All-Star game in his career. This is what? Year 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. This is year 11 of CJ's career. And he's been a 20-point-per-game scorer since year 3. So that's 9 years of CJ McCollum being a 20-point-per-game scorer on pretty consistently to 46, 40, 80 splits. Right, and in these last two seasons, I would even argue he's genuinely become a better playmaker. Like I remember when CJ was just a bucket, and that was all he was—just a, a small guard who was a bucket. But he has transformed his game to providing a level of playmaking that this New Orleans Pelicans is needed and has become integral to their success specifically. Like they don't have that elite playmaker on their team. But when you got five dudes capable of giving you five to six assists a night, like that's, I feel like that's low key a lot of the playmaking that you need. Um, CJ's just gone under the radar. Like the Pelicans have a low key big three, not like a crazy big three, but a low key big three that no one wants to talk about. They also have um, a great defensive identity. CJ, from a skill standpoint, can score at all three levels. Maybe not elite at the rim, but I know from the mid-range, he's a bucket. From three, he's obviously a bucket. Um, he's improved his playmaking. And honestly, just in terms of entertainment, man, CJ's bag, underrated as shit. <laughs> so shout out, shout out the uh shout out to CJ McCollum, man. Shout out to CJ McCollum. The next player I want to bring up. You know, I gotta get my Boston representation in this bitch. I wanna talk about Christoph Porzingis, y'all. I want to talk about Chris Paul's season. And maybe he's not actually underrated. It is what it is. But I personally feel like his impact and his importance to this team has gone underappreciated. And I don't think a lot of NBA fans really truly get how important Chris Stops is on this team. Because number one, I've seen this team play without Chris Stops, and this team transforms into a completely different team for the worst way possible. I watched the 2022 finals recently, and I feel like on top of just, you know, Steph Curry being Steph Curry, the reason why we lost was because of how stagnant our offense was. I think for four years now, we've been get we've, we've got away with stagnant offense just from a pure talent perspective because of how many great perimeter players Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown have played along with on top of them themselves being great perimeter players. So you can run a stagnant five out um isolation heavy offense because of the fact that these two are leading the helm. You know what I'm saying? And that has been the downfall with this team also in the last two years is that when that shot is not falling, when you got teams who are great defensively, who can game plan against that, who has the personnel as well to game plan against that, that's when you get the stinkers that you get. Because what is what is, what is the secondary option? What do we fall back to? It's just more threes, more driving kicks. And again, you can get away with it with the with this type of personnel. And even in the games without Kristaps, we have gotten away with that with this type of personnel. But 
in the games that we lost, I feel like that's been our downfall. Is when the going gets rough, when we cannot get a bucket. Number one, this guy, for some reason, struggles in the clutch. And number two, we don't have these other options that we can go to in the clutch. Aside from isolation, hey, let's get a bucket basketball. But when Kristaps Sporzingis is in the game, number one, defensively, he's our best rim protector. Number two, he's our best re, uh, second best rebounder. Um, number three, on the offensive end, he provides a level of scoring from the mid post and even just in the post in general that gives us a second option that is not technically it is isolation, but I I feel like it's a little bit better. More efficient, especially if you look at the numbers, than just JT, JB go into the go out into the wing and try to ha, 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 out there. You know what I'm saying? Um, you can run more actions out of the post from from the mid post with Chris Tops, right? Um, so that's one. Number two, there's no pick and pop threat on this team when Chris Tops is not on the floor. Al Horford can try. But I don't think that's the same anymore. He's 37 years old. He's 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 slower than he used to be. Um, still, if he can still do it here and there, but it's not. I'm telling you right now, it's not as effective as a Chris Stops Porzingis pick and pop. Um, and also, as a lob threat, there really is no lob threat on this team outside of Jason Tatum, outside of Al Horford. But even then, I think y'all are understanding what I'm saying when I mean a lob threat. You know what I'm saying? A pick and roll lob threat. I think Chris Stoutsrazingis provides that when he's on this team. So just the value that he brings. I think, you know, the, the best player is always the most valuable player to me. Um, and I don't this is not no this at Jalen Brown. He's had a phenomenal season. But I think in terms of importance to this team, and honestly, just, you know, who who's the better player as well? You can make a really strong argument that Chris Stoutsrazingis is the second best player. On the best team in the league. Um, I don't think that gets talked about enough, man. I don't think that gets talked about enough. Next up, I want to talk about Daniel Gafford of the Dallas Mavericks. When we talk about players, when we talk about trade deadline trades that we might look back in history and transformed history, I think Daniel Gafford may be in those talks. Um, Daniel Gafford is a player that's been kind of just gone under the radar because he's been playing for the bum ass wizards, but he is the perfect, the perfect big (laughs) to pair along with Luca pick and roll big, extremely efficient at the rim, leading the league at field, uh, field goal percentage at the rim right now, shooting 78% to be honest with you. So Shooting 73% from the season, but with Dallas specifically, he's even better, right? Um, Great rebounder. Can provide um, shot blocking as well. And he has just been so valuable to this Dallas team, along with P.J. Washington being added at the trade deadline. And even P.J. Washington, honestly, is underperforming. But I, I really do think things really switched and this team and their makeup became different when Daniel Gafford became a, a, a part of this team. Um, on top of Derek Lively still coming off the bench, um, I think Daniel I, I think Daniel Gafford is just a more solid, more proven Derek Lively, to be honest with you. And for a team that's trying to win right now, they need a they need a better version of Derek Lively that Derek Lively just cannot be in his rookie season, which is fine. You know what I'm saying? But still having Derek Lively coming off the bench is still really good. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? If P.J. Washington can just be a better three-point shooter, which I've seen this one game where he, he made like back-to-back threes in a clutch recently. If he could just become that, bro, I think this team is legitimately like a, a championship. I think they already are a championship contender, to be honest with you. But um, in terms of importance to important teams, um, and also the fact that he's 25, I think Daniel Gafford... Is, is a player that can stay in Dallas for a long time, can be a partner for Luka Doncic for a long time, and they can make Luka Magic in Dallas with Daniel Gafford um, at the four or five. So just shout out to Daniel Gafford, man. Shout out to Daniel Gafford. Moving on. I want to shout out Dante DiVincenzo, bro. Dante DiVincenzo. Um... 
when you think about New York this season, a lot of the focus has been on Jalen Brunson, and rightfully so. Right, I'm not about to sit here and say Dante DiVincenzo has been the best player for the New York Knicks because he hasn't, okay? Jalen Brunson is playing at MVP levels, to be honest with you. Is he the MVP winner? No. MVP levels? Yes. Um, And, I, I you know, I, I don't want to take away too much from this team because they are well coached. They are pretty deep. But in a season where Julius Randle has missed 46 games, in a season where they traded away R.J. Barrett and Emmanuel Quickly, got O.G. back, but O.G. got injured shortly after. In a season where Mitchell Robinson has only played 28 games, the New York Knicks, one, have had one of their most successful seasons in recent history. And number two, they're like the three seed right now. But in, in that time where, you know, um, injuries are going down, someone had to step up. And they've been winning games because of why? Number one, Jalen Brunson. And number two, Dante DiVincenzo stepping up and honestly becoming their second best scorer. Because if, if we look at Dante DiVincenzo's last 24 games, again, not the most efficient, right? 42%. But we're looking at a dude who's upped his production to 19 points a game, giving you three assists, giving you four rebounds. 42% from the field, fine. He's not fucking perfect. But he's shooting 12 threes a game on 39% shooting. That is crazy. That, hey, let's keep it a stack. That's like Klay Thompson, Steph Curry shit. All right? Maybe not Steph Curry shit because he's not really shooting off the dribble. But Klay Thompson shit. And he's getting to the line twice a, twice a night on 79%. Nothing, nothing to really brag about, right? But, and honestly, I'm looking at the stretch right here. What is this stretch? I haven't even, let's stretch it out to here. Yeah, the numbers look better if we stretch it out to here. This is the last 32 games. <laughs> 21 points, 43, 39, 76. Um, but yeah, let's let's look at this stretch over here because I, I didn't even see this. 30, 28. Seen a lot of high 20s in the stretch. This is a six game stretch where Dante DiVincenzo was a 29 point per game scorer, bro. <laughs> On 47, 42, 80 splits. So yeah, I just I don't think Dante DiVincenzo has been talked about enough um with this team whatsoever. Um, and he's been an integral part to this team, bro. Been a been a very, very integral part to this team. So, um, yeah, man. Shout out to Dante. And last but not least, I may ruffle some feathers again with this one because you might be saying, "Be so why is he in this video?" I want to shout out Kevin Durant. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm closing this video shouting out one Kevin Durant. Because I think the season that he's having so far has gone so under the radar. It actually makes little sense. And I think it's it's a culmination of a bunch of things, right? I think, um, for one, the slander, the KD slander has gone overboard to the point where I feel like motherfuckers just overlook KD because we know what KD is and all that shit, right? Um, I think the expectations of this team as well going into the season was supposed to be for a lot of y'all, not for me, but for a lot of y'all, super team, number one seed, right? And for this team to be a playing team right now, I believe, I believe right now they're a playing team. It's like, bro, I'm not about to, I'm not about to reward you for what being like underachieving like crazy. So I get why people are overlooking them. And I think as NBA fans, we do this thing where, like, when a team underachieves, we just don't care what those individual players do because they weren't what they were supposed to be. But when reality, but reality is different from expectations. And reality is X player doesn't have as much help as, much help as we thought. And they are doing as much as they can with the help that they got. And um, for a team that's been injury riddled throughout this whole season, you know what I'm saying? D Book missed 16, uh, 14 games himself if he plays 60. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how many games they have left, but let's just say D Book misses 10 plus games, right? Uh, Bradley Bill is about to miss 30 games, right? Um, specifically for a team that relies on those three to be healthy. Um, for a team in the Western Conference. For KD to, number one, have the healthiest season he's had in five years, maybe even six years. One, two, three, four, five. Five years. The healthiest season, he's played 73 games. Um, For KD 
to step up defensively because I I was very skeptical of this team and their defense when they were relying on an injury-prone center, 29-year-old Yusuf Nurkic as the backbone of their defense, and on top of that, Kevin Durant at 35 years old to be the backbone of their defense. I was very I was very worried of that, but the Kevin but for Kevin Durant to step up defensively and truly become an integral part to their defense, which is a defense that's 13th in the league. I understand that that's nothing really to brag about, but nevertheless, KD has been really good defensively this season. Um, while on top of that, still giving the 27-5 and five we're used to on 50-40, damn near 90 splits. At age 35, leading the, the team in minutes. I don't think that gets talked about enough. I don't think that gets talked about enough, bro. Um... Yeah, I think K- KD KD's had a good season. KD's had a good season. And truth be told, he's still not that far removed from those top five conversations as much as it feels like he is. You know, I think the, the focus right now a lot is on the Lukas, the Jokic's, the Giannis, the SGA's of the world. And then after that, you might even get into the Kawhi, JT, um, Anthony Davis, LeBron shits, but in may, maybe even Jalen Brunson, right? But I think in that conversation is still KD. And you can make a, an argument that in that conversation, KD is still at the top of that tier. KD still might be the fifth best player in the league. But I feel like with the conversations that we're having with him or the lack thereof, it feels like he's closer to like 13. I don't know, 12. I don't know. But nevertheless, here is my list once again. I had it on the other monitor the whole time, but Giannis, Paolo, Zion, Aaron Gordon, D'Lo, CJ, Kristaps, Daniel Gafford, Dante DiVincenzo, and Kevin Durant. I just want to shout out some quick hitters as far as underrated players as well. Um, I want to shout out DeMontis Sabonis. I want to shout out, honestly, a lot of the San Antonio Spurs players. That might be a, a quick a heater take for 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 this video but I truly feel like a lot of these players are actually better than what they seem it's just the Spurs were trolling this whole season to tank and I don't I don't know like Keldon Johnson and Devin Vassell they're talented players that don't get the recognition that they deserve because (laughs) again the Hawks were trolling um not the Hawks the Spurs were trolling speaking of the Hawks though which is why I mentioned that I think DeJounte Murray has become underappreciated as well I think a lot of the Chicago Bulls players have become underappreciated as well because they're stuck in this, such a, a purgatory situation. Um, maybe even a, a motherfucker like Tobias Harris. I don't know, bro. Like to, Tobias Harris is kind of in that CJ territory of never being an All Star, never having an award, but he's been like an eighteen efficient eighteen to twenty point per game scorer since twenty fifteen and just been consistently that. Um, never more, never less, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, man, a lot, a lot of underappreciated stars in the league. You know, there is a finite level of attention that we can give to these players, but, um, I'm going to give some of those, I'm going to give some of that attention to, uh, some of these underappreciated players today. But with that being said, let me know what you think in the comment section down below. And, um, I'm out, man. Peace.